Good afternoon. I'm Linda Clement, the Vice President for Student Affairs, and it's my pleasure to be your host for this recognition event for veterans. We're very pleased to be here today. I'd ask you to please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Maryland Honor Guard and remain standing for the national anthem sung by Manor Music. Thank you to our Honor Guard and our Manor Music. We really appreciate your efforts. Please continue sta standing as we warmly welcome middle school students from the College Park Academy. Their academic program will allow them to take up to 60 college credits at Maryland when they reach high school, so we hope to see many of them back on campus. Please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This College Park Academy has done a terrific job 
of doing this, and we're so pleased to have them here today, and we can ask them to be seated. Thank you. Our university president, Dr. Wallace Lowe, has been a strong advocate for our student veterans on campus. You can all be seated. Um, under his leadership, Maryland has created spaces and opportunities for our veterans to succeed. Please join me in welcoming Wallace Lowe. Thank you, Linda. And thank you all for coming to today's service. On this day, 95 years ago, the soldiers of the Great War rediscovered silence. At precisely the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, Silent guns announced the armistice and ended the fighting. Four years earlier, brass bands greeted the declaration of war. But now, there was only silent exhaustion. Ever since, Veterans Day celebrates silence. Abraham Lincoln was right. The actions of the living and the dead who served alone have eloquence. Our words have little power to add or to detract. What counts is our service to our veterans. At the University of Maryland, we can and we must make your homecoming and your transition as seamlessly as possible by helping you to learn and succeed at the university, we can help fulfill the prophetic vision of turning swords into plowshares. The University of Maryland has been designated by the federal government as a center for excellence for veterans' success. We are here to help you turn that page. It has been said that we often take for granted that which most deserves our gratitude. I want, to, I want you to know the University of Maryland will never take for granted the service of our veterans for our country. We salute your service. We honor your commitment. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. We will now have a reflection that will be led by our long-term chaplains at the University of Maryland, Reverend Holly Ulmer, representing the Unitas Campus Ministry, and Tarif Shrem, representing the Muslim Chaplaincy. Please join us. God of our past, present, and future, we ask for your blessing upon us as we gather here to honor our University of Maryland veterans, the students, faculty, staff, and alumni who have valiantly served in our nation's military, and those who continue to serve around the world. We remember with much gratitude their dutiful service and the great sacrifices they have made and continue to make for the greater good of our country. God of our strength and courage, place a special blessing upon our veterans and those actively engaged in military service. Be their fortress and shield, especially in times of challenge and adversity. Make their efforts a means to bring hope to the hopeless, healing to the broken, and peace to a world torn by so much pain and suffering. Bless also, O oh God, their families, 
those who have held our servicemen and women in great love and have ardently prayed and kept watch for a safe return home. May all of us never fail our brave soldiers who have given so much, those of the past and the present. Today, we will also pause to remember the University of Maryland veterans that we have lost in this past year. And we cannot gather without also expressing our deepest heartfelt appreciation for all who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. You, O oh Lord, have the power to bind up all our wounds and bring us through times of trial and fire. It is you, O oh God, who carries us through our battles, those conflicts fought in fields of war, and those deep in the recesses of our hearts. For your ever-abiding presence, O oh God, and the victories you offer us for the living of our days, we are ever thankful and filled with hope. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Thank you to our chaplains for that wonderful moment of reflection. And now I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to our first veteran speaker, University of Maryland undergraduate student Henry Kampal Hollis. During his eight years as a U.S. Marine, Henry deployed several times to Iraq and worked in three American embassies. As a Maryland native, he began his undergraduate education following his military service and is currently a senior obtaining a B.S. in Geographical Sciences. Henry. I'm very nervous, I'm not going to lie. <clears throat> Good afternoon, veterans, faculty, staff, family, and friends. My name is Henry Carvajalas. I am a senior at the University of Maryland, and I am a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. I have dedicated 10 years of my life to defend this nation during a time of war. In, in addition, today is a very special day. Today, we take the time to mourn and celebrate. We mourn for my brothers and sisters that have made the ultimate sacrifice. And we celebrate for my brothers and sisters that make the choice to put themselves in harm's way so you do not have to. I give them my eternal gratitude. In the Marine Corps, I did it by being ready for PT at 0500. I stand corrected. I did it by being ready for physical training at 5 a.m. I did it by ensuring that my junior Marines were taken care of and I did it by supporting my superiors. Today I continue to show my gratitude, but I would be lying if I told you it was not easy. Before I had to support my brothers in arms, that regardless of what happened, they always had my back. I had the support of my superiors, Marines that knew all the answers to all my problems. It took some time to realize, but the support is still there. Today, my greatest supports are the veterans that attend the University of Maryland and that are sitting here right now. After I found my fellow student veterans, I realized that we share many struggles. We struggle to fit in. Many veterans know life is different compared to the military life as it is to civilian life. And it's even harder as a student. We struggle to prevent our wounds from getting in the way of our goals. Some of us carry wounds physically evident to others, and others that are completely hidden from us, not knowing. We struggle by having to prove our worthiness again in society. Are we good at, can we achieve what we want to achieve in life? If it were not for the support of the veterans at the university, I would not be here standing before you as a senior ready to graduate. I give them my eternal gratitude. I do it by volunteering in programs like America Reads, America Counts, a program dedicated to helping children in the subjects of reading and math in elementary school. I do it by being part of Mavery, a program dedicated to helping other colleges establish what the University of Maryland has here for our veterans, a place where we can find one another, a place where we can support one another, and a place where we can find the resources that allow us to succeed make our transition easier from military life to student life and to any life. I do it by being part 
of a student organization called Turt Vets. I try the best of my abilities to provide them all the information they may not need, but the benefit of the doubt that it may, they may be useful in the long run, in the future. Hopefully, hopefully allowing them to achieve their bachelor's, a master's, or a PhD. <clears throat> I do it overall by conducting myself in a manner that will make them proud, that will make you proud. So today, ask yourselves, what can I do to show my appreciation? It can be as simple as listening to another veteran speak. So think about it and just do it. Thank you, God bless, and happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Henry, for sharing your reflections, and we wish you every success. Our next speaker is Aaron Iveson, who serves as a university manager in our Department of Resident Life. Aaron was commissioned into the United States Army in 1994 through the Army Reserves Officer Training Corps, ROTC, at Cornell University. She worked as an electronic intelligence officer in support of operations in several countries and held leadership positions throughout her career at the platoon company and battalion levels. She came to work with us in 2005 and we're so pleased. She's involved and dedicated to campus life and we're happy to have her with us today. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Dr. Clement. Distinguished guests, Friends, family, colleagues, fellow veterans, it is an honor to be speaking with you today and sharing a bit about my military experience and, that, and how that has influenced my work today. When the planning committee asked me if I'd like to speak on behalf of the staff and faculty on campus, I have to admit, like Henry, I was pretty nervous to take on the task. I wondered what I might have to say. What's happened over the last several weeks, though, has been an incredible opportunity to reflect in a way that I haven't before on my time in the service, as well as my time as a veteran. One of the things that keeps bubbling up is a motto I learned very early in my career, going back to my lieutenant days in my officer basic course. Mission first, people always. The idea that while we know the mission must be accomplished, if you take care of your people from the start, the mission will always follow. As a newly minted captain, I was fortunate enough to take command of a headquarters company at the Intelligence School at Fort Huachuca. When I took over the company, I had the sense that something wasn't quite right. Morale was low. The unit lacked cohesion. The mission was getting done, but not very well. I'll be the first again to admit that I really had no idea what I was supposed to do about it. But I did know that the lives of these soldiers and NCOs were my responsibility. So I, in the end, had to figure that out. My first sergeant and I set about doing the one thing we knew we could do, and that was taking care of our people. We spent time every day meeting each soldier where they worked and where they lived. I got to know their jobs and to know and understand what they felt was their responsibility toward the unit. We did little things like a monthly recognition ceremony, reinstituted hails and farewells, anything to help them see that they were each a valued member of the unit and that they were part of a larger whole. I spent most of my days listening, being present and visible, cajoling when necessary, pushing each to accomplish new goals, learning what was important to each individual. At the end of my command two years later, the company had improved its performance across the board. While it's easy to look at performance metrics to see how the unit had improved, what I valued most about that time is the personal growth and development that I witnessed in each one of my soldiers. One of the greatest gifts I received as I left command was a collection of notes and letters that my first sergeant had put together from members of my unit. Typed letters and handwritten notes that recalled various events in the life of our unit. The tough conversations, the radical training events, the pranks and parties that brought us all together. Notes of thanks and appreciation that I hadn't looked at since I left the service. In my reflections over these last couple of weeks, I pulled that notebook out again, and I was reminded how much I had touched the lives of my soldiers in ways that I hadn't even realized then. 
More importantly, though, I was also reminded just how much of an impact each one of those soldiers had on my own growth and development. I'm thankful for those connections and experiences, and I wouldn't trade one minute of that time in command. All of this reminds me daily of that valuable lesson that stayed with me throughout my career. Mission first, people always. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share. Thank you to Erin for being here to tell her story today. It was very inspiring. Before we hear from our third veteran speaker, we invite you to join us in singing the hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, known in military circles as the Navy Hymn. I think you'll find some of the verses seemed fitting for other branches of the service as well. Today, our organist, Edmund Perkins, will play one verse of the Navy Hymn, Manor Music will follow, and then the audience will join in. Please stand and refer to the insert in your program for the words. Thank you again, Manor Music and our organist. Please be seated for our final veteran speaker, Carl Sanzano. A lifetime resident of Merrill, Carl enlisted in the U.S. Navy, became a Navy corpsman, and served his entire active and reserve duty with units of the U.S. Marine Corps. When deployed in Okinawa, Japan, he took his first course at a University of Maryland Extension campus and later graduated with a degree in economics from College Park. He also holds a master's degree in business from the Johns Hopkins University. A senior partner at Booz Hamilton, Allen Hamilton, Carl founded the firm, the firm's Veterans Agenda Committee, which brings the full resources of the firm to support veterans and their families, and the Wounded Warrior Mentoring Program, which assists veterans transitioning into jobs, education, and training. And suddenly, yesterday, I found out that Booz Allen Hamilton, 30% of its employees are veterans, and so we applaud them for that effort.
faculty, staff, veterans, students, thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, I really wanted to start, I've been thinking about the other speakers and what they had to say. I thought I'd start with the messages first and then sort of fill in a little bit with the stories. Um, for the veterans, I just want to encourage uh, you to finish your degrees. It's had such a profound impact on my life to have a degree from a great institution like the University of Maryland. It opened lots of doors in my career and allowed me to ascend to a fairly high position in uh, one of the premier consulting uh, firms worldwide. And I'd encourage you to uh, help your uh, brothers in arms think about getting uh, their educations. Uh, it'll, it'll just make a profound uh, impact on their lives. Um, for the student body, I would encourage you to think about uh, helping veterans integrate into your lives. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the gap in, in, in time and the sort of the maturity factor. I, I joined uh, the University of Maryland after some military duty, and it's a little bit hard to, uh, to get fully integrated. So anything you can do to help with that. Um, for the, uh, the faculty, I would encourage you to become mentors to veterans. And I had a, a pretty sig a significant uh, mentor in Gordon Prang, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my experiences with him. And then for the administration, I would say, uh, I know we're trying to create an elite institution here that's highly regarded, but let's keep the doors wide open for the veterans. And when you hear the story about how I uh, managed to uh, apply and be accepted, you, you actually, Linda, uh, there's a pretty good story around that. It probably wouldn't happen today. Um, I came from a uh, military family. My father served uh, in World War II. He had uh, nine and a half months as a rifleman in combat and he had a pretty profound impact on me when I was growing up and I sort of really understood uh, what it was like to, uh, for uh, veterans to be on the front line and sort of the hardships they go through and I, I, it really affected how I thought about uh, uh, serving our country. Uh, I was accepted to uh, three U.S. military academies right out of high school and I didn't, uh, decided not to go. I was only 17 years old. I was the second uh, youngest kid in a class, high school class of 605 here in uh, Maryland. And I goofed off for a couple of years. And, uh, and, and I wanted to sort of compare and contrast a little bit about uh, what it was like in that era versus today. I mean, society was in somewhat of upheaval. Uh, we were at the sort of the height of the civil rights movement. We were in a very unpopular war in Vietnam. There was lots of protest. Uh, there was a draft going on. I think the biggest difference between then and now is that we have an all-volunteer force. The people who go in today are really select, elite, sort of top of their class, and go, go into the service because they want to serve their country. They're there voluntarily. It was a little bit different in my era. Uh, you know, lots of people are trying to avoid the draft. They didn't want to go 13,000 miles away. Uh, and I certainly understood it wasn't a popular war. I uh, enlisted and uh, I wanted to help people. And the last thing my father wanted me to do was to be in the infantry. And uh, guess what? My whole class out of hospital corps school uh, was assigned to the Fleet Marine Force. And that's where I spent the next few years was in the infantry, which actually I think was a, a very good experience because you understand uh, sort of the, the hardships, the fatigue, the the uh, demands that are physical and mental demands that are placed on our soldiers uh, on the front line. So I served my last tour of duty with the uh, 3rd Marine Division in Okinawa, Japan. And while I was there, I decided to take a course at UMUC in psychology. It was taught by an Air Force major. And it was a six-week course. And I had to take the bus. And it was sort of hard to do uh, field training and you know, read the books and do the course. But I did get an A in it. And it was on the tail end of the Vietnam conflict. And uh, there were, you know, the, army, the armed forces decided they didn't need as many of us and that they wanted to get rid of us as quickly as possible. And they offered us early outs. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice if I could hit the spring semester? And I wrote a letter to the uh, director of veteran affairs and say, hey, I'm, you know, this uh, hospital corpsman and I'm getting out. Any chance I could get to Maryland? And I just sent this letter off and about, I don't know, three, four weeks, weeks later, I got a letter back saying you've been accepted. So I told that story to Linda about 10 or 12 years ago, and she started laughing and said, that would never happen today. You know? <laughs> but I would encourage you to think about letting those sorts of things happen. 
uh, the, the veterans have uh, paid a big price. And the, the difference I'd say today is that there are deployments that are two, three, four deployments. And when you're deployed, you're, you're, you're sequestered away from you know, normal uh, civilian life and you sort of, you have a gap in time. These folks are coming back, they're looking for opportunities and opening the doors to the university and uh, accepting them and, you know, helping them get channeled into the right career, you know, fields and so forth, I think is, is really something that's, you know, tremendously needed, uh, you know, for our vets. So uh, I guess I'd just like to uh, talk a little bit about Gordon Prang. He was a pretty famous history professor here at the University of Maryland. And uh, I was unsure about what I wanted to study, medicine, economics, history. I was really interested in, in history, Western history in particular. And I took several courses from uh, Dr. Prang. Uh, I wanted to get a job, so I studied economics as well. And that's what my degree is in. But he had office hours, and he took an interest in his students. And he personally mentored me. And he had a profound impact in terms of my self-esteem uh, coming back into the civilian world. And so if you think you've been, in those days, they didn't have internet, they didn't have telephone communications. We were basically deployed for 13 months. And you come back, and the rest of the world's been going on. I was 23 when I started at Maryland. Most of the students were 18 or 19. I felt a little bit uh, like a fish out of water. You know, how do I fit in? Uh, am I as good as these, you know, students who are uh, just starting out? They're probably, you know, top of their class, uh, coming, you know, fresh out of high school. And, you know, how do I fit in? And uh, Dr. Prang helped me a lot with that. And he, he basically looked me in the eye one day and he said, I want you to know you're as good as any student that I've ever met here or at Harvard or anywhere else. And you have to believe that in your heart. And then you have to, you know, uh, let go of any insecurities or, uh, you know, what you might think are, you know, I don't fit in and just move on. And there were lots of moments in my mentoring with him where he did that. And I just thought it was, you know, uh, incredibly powerful to have someone of his stature. For those of you that don't know, he wrote Torah, Torah, Torah. And at dawn we slept, and he was a famous uh, professor on uh, the history of uh, World War II in the Pacific. So I would uh, implore faculty to think about making office hours available and mentoring some of your young veterans and helping them integrate. I would ask that the uh, students here do the same thing. You know, create friendships, open doors, let people into your lives, let the veterans affect you and let, and, and uh, vice versa. Uh, and to the vets, there's nothing more important than your education. No one can ever take it away. Uh, it will affect how you think about uh, problem solving and life, and, it, and it's something that will open a lot of doors uh, for you uh, over time. So that's my message for today, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me. We want to thank Carl for taking the time to be with us today and for telling his story. We really appreciate it. We now want to take a moment to remember the University of Maryland veterans that we have lost in the past year. You will see on the screen behind me the names of 87 veteran alumni who have passed away since October of 2012. Their service to the nation spans decades and covers times of both war and peace. I invite you to reflect on all of the university alumni veterans we have lost this year during the next patriotic musical selection from Music Manor called Prayers of Children.
We will now offer a tribute to all veterans in attendance today, as well as their family member and friends who have joined them on their journeys. Members of the Mighty Sound of Maryland will play the Armed Services Medley. I ask all veterans to stand and be recognized when the branch's theme is played. Family and friends are encouraged to honor veterans in their lives by standing during the appropriate song. So we have the mighty sound of the marching band. conclude our formal part of the program with a benediction by Reverend Raymond Ranker, our Lutheran chaplain, and the playing of the taps by Cadet Captain Alexander Downs from Army ROTZ. Please rise. I ask you to remain in place until the Honor Guard retires the colors and Reverend Ranker and Cadet Downs begin their procession outside. Beginning at the front of the chapel, ushers from ROTC and College Park Civil Air Patrol will be dismissing rows to join the procession. We hope you will be able to join us for lunch on the chapel grounds. And I would just like to say a note of thank you to all of our organizers of this event today, particularly Denise McHugh. We thank you for your good service. I invite you to bow your heads. O oh God, we pray that peace may prevail on this earth. And as this is not yet a reality, we give thanks for the men and women of our armed services who serve and defend our country and the values of freedom and justice we hold so dear. May they be a means of fostering mutual respect and understanding among all peoples of the world. O oh God, we also pray that we would be ever mindful of the sacrifices our veterans make and the hardship endured by their families and friends so that we may never take for granted the privileges they have secured for us. Help us as a nation to support our veterans and to honor them and their sacrifices by giving them the proper care they deserve, not only when they are in active duty, but also as they return to civilian life. And finally, O oh God, we pray that you look with compassion on all who endure the miseries of war 
and be mindful of those who day and night face peril in defense of our nation. We honor and give thanks for all those who have shown the greatest love by laying down their lives for others. Amen.